Hello, everyone. Welcome to our briefing. Our first speaker today is Jose de Bastos. Jose is an analyst on World Aware's America's Regional Intelligence Team. Jose is originally a Venezuelan native with a background in journalism and political communication and an expert in South American politics. Jose is going to provide background on why the potential for unrest is so high during the upcoming election. Jose? Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon, and, and thank you, everyone, for being here in the webinar with us. Uh, as mentioned, I will be speaking about the potential for major protests, disruptions, and violence during and especially at, immediately after the November 3rd presidential election in the U.S. Uh, but before we talk about certain factors that have increased the risk for violence, uh, it is important to highlight that a lot of what may happen in the days after the election uh, really depends on how close the result of the election is. If, for example, by late November 3rd or, or early November 4th, there's a clear tendency favoring one of the two main candidates, the likelihood of white, uh, widespread disruptions will significantly decrease. However, because of the current context that we're living in, uh, we believe it is unlikely that during the night of November 3rd, there will be clarity about uh, the winner, about who the, the winner of the presidential election is going to be. So let's talk more about that context. Uh, well, basically, the, the main reason to forecast that uh, no clear winner uh, of the presidential election will be known on November the 3rd is the way in which Americans are voting in the election this year. Uh, of course, due to the coronavirus disease pandemic, uh, COVID-19, most states uh, amended their laws to allow people to vote if they choose to by mail. As of October 28, yesterday, 74 million people had already voted, nearly 50 million of them by mail. These numbers are already higher than the total number of early votes casted in 2016 and are going to continue growing until uh, during the next few days. Now, processing and counting uh, votes cast by mail is more complicated than counting uh, the votes cast in person. Uh, because of this, most states have allowed election officials to start the processing of mail-in ballots days or even weeks before election date to facilitate the vote count and making it possible for those states to have a large majority of the votes counted on election night. However, there are a few states that only allow official, officials to start processing the mail-in ballots the same day of the election, thus delaying the vote count and the announcement of the results. Among the states that do not allow the processing of mail ballots before November 3rd are Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, are Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, while Michigan only allows the processing of these mail ballots uh, one day before the election. Uh, it is expected that in these three states, uh, uh, around half of all votes will be submitted by mail. Uh, as you know, these three states were key in deciding the 2016 presidential election in favor of then uh, Republican nominee uh, Donald Trump by very small margins. Actually, his accumulated advantage in Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin was only uh, 78,000 votes out of a total of 14 million votes. Uh, these states, once again, are likely to be key in deciding the winner and uh, it is possible that the result there is once again very close. Um, and because of the, the counting of the mail-in ballots and the delays that this, this may have, uh, we may not know who won these states uh, in the several days after November the 3rd or even more than a week after, uh, after November the 3rd. Now, under this scenario in which a close election depends on the results in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, other fact in Wisconsin, other factors could delay and complicate uh, the vote count even further. For example, Pennsylvania allows mail-in ballots that arrive until November 6 to be counted, which will of course extend the amount of time uh, the state needs to determine a winner. Uh, and additionally, at, at least two relatively large counties, uh, Cumberland and Erie County, uh, have announced that they will start processing and counting these mail ballots hours after the election, the, the polls close on November the 3rd. And once they have counted all the in-person ballots, so obviously the results, at least in those two counties, but it's possible that this will happen in more counties, uh, will not be known on November the 3rd, and, you know, officially will not be known on November the 3rd. Another issue that could, could create problems, and not just in these Midwestern states, but basically in any states uh, that have a, clo a close result, is that thousands of mail-in ballots are likely to be rejected and not counted due to several technicalities. Uh, just for example, during this year's primaries, the number of mail-in ballots rejected in both Michigan and Wisconsin was larger than the margin of victory in the, in the 2016 presidential election 
in those two states. And of course, many more people are voting by mail in the general election compared to the primary and compared to previous elections. So of course, a rejection of thousands uh, of, votes, of votes, even if uh, you know legal, uh, could create a lot of unease among voters, especially if they feel this affects their candidate and affects uh, the final results and of course could lead to more protests. So if like we have been saying that the presidential election really comes down to one of the states that began counting mail ballots late, the country would likely go through several days of uncertainty without knowing who the president-elect is. Uh, well, this has occurred in the past, obviously more, uh, more recently in the year 2000, without creating widespread disruptions or violence, uh, the increase in polarization we, we have seen in recent years and a declining trust in major institutions uh, make unrest much more likely if, if such, a, such a scenario occurs in 2020. Uh, for example, a study conducted by the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group found that 21% of respondents would justify the use of violence if the opposing party wins the 2020 presidential election. Additionally, we have seen uh, many violent actions and plots in recent years, uh, including the shooting of Republican members of Congress in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, the homicide of a left-leaning demonstrator by a far-right sympathizer in Charlottesville, Virginia, both of these actions in 2017. More recently, a few only a few weeks ago, uh, there have been recently deadly shootings in and around demonstrations in Kenosha, uh, Wisconsin, and in Portland, Oregon. Also, earlier this month, the FBI announced the arrest of 13 people accused of planning to, uh, to kidnap the governor of Michigan. So, of course, we see uh, that politically motiv motivated violence has become a more frequent and, and somewhat even more accepted than in the recent past. Additionally, like, like mentioned, the trust in some major institutions have been, has been declining in recent decades. Uh, for example, a Pew Research Center study showed that only about 40% of respondents trust uh, their elected officials, and there are growing disparities based on party affiliation in the way citizens perceive other institutions. Uh, while 70% of Democratic Party supporters trust in mass media organizations, only 15% of Republican Party supporters feel the same way. On the contrary, 75% of Republican Party supporters have a favorable view of the Supreme Court compared with only 49% of Democratic Party supporters. Another factor, of course, to take into consideration is that already 2020 has been a year uh, of massive and widespread demonstrations throughout the country, including some that, that ended uh, in clashes with police, clashes between opposing groups of protesters, as well as in looting. Uh, the US Crisis Project counted uh, politically motivated protests occurred in 2,440 locations this summer throughout the country, uh, following the death of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, while most of these protests ended peacefully, there was violence in 220 of, of these locations. Just this past Tuesday, uh, we saw demonstrations in Philadelphia that also ended in the looting of several businesses during the, during the night. All this shows that the U.S. citizenry is, clear, is clearly mo uh, mobilized and willing to take to the streets and make demands. So if large parts of the population feel that the electoral process is being mishandled and that their side is being affected, affected then mass protests will, would likely occur. Additionally, it is important to highlight how widespread these protests in 2020 have been, not only focused in major cities, where mass demonstrations have been more common throughout the years, but also occurred in small towns, in rural areas, and in the suburbs. So controversy over the 2020 presidential election could lead to protests in all sorts of locations. A lot of them would, would likely be concentrated in the states that would decide the election, in those states where the results uh, have not been announced or have not been certified uh, you know, hours after November the 3rd, and also in the capital cities of those states. So, for example, if the election depends on the result in the state of Michigan, then major protests are likely to occur not only in a major city like Detroit, but also around uh, government offices in the capital city of Lansing. Uh, if Florida is once again the, the key to the election, then demonstration, demonstrations are likely uh, you know, in big cities like Miami and Jacksonville, but also in the capital uh, of Tallahassee. Uh, however, we do want to emphasize that in the wake of major uncertainty about the election, uh, multiple locations might experience protests. So, so businesses should not consider themselves to be immune to unrest just because they have offices outside. Uh, no, their offices are not in downtown urban areas. 
So, in all, uh, several days of uncertainty with a voting process in which uh, rel relatively distrusted institutions will be in charge of counting and announcing the results with a polarized and mobilized uh, population may lead to widespread protests and disruptions. Uh, as mentioned, these protests uh, are likely to occur in multiple locations, uh, locations, even if centered around the states in which the results have not uh, been certified. The number of demonstrations is also likely to grow rapidly if the uncertainty and the perceived doubts about the election uh, continue for days. Uh, finally, we, we must add that multiple organizations on both sides of the political spectrum are already preparing their supporters to demonstrate on the night of November the 3rd and the following days in case uh, they perceive the candidate they're supporting is being cheated, is being, the result is being uh, mishandled. Um, this does not necessarily mean that all of these groups are going to demonstrate, uh, but it is likely that at least some of them will. And it is also important to note that uh, many of these organized protest groups are not really directed, directly managed or coordinated uh, by the campaigns. And many of these groups actually have uh, positions that are more extreme than those of the candidates and the two major parties. Um, so if uh, protest groups would not necessarily respond to, to the candidates if they are calling for calm in the days following the elections, because they usually you know, are outside of, of the coordination of the campaigns and are usually more extreme than the candidates in the campaigns uh, themselves. Our next speaker is our special guest speaker, Kevin Davis. Kevin is the Director of Security Consulting at Garda World and has a notable career in law enforcement and crisis management. He was Baltimore's police commissioner from 2015 to 2018 following the historic riots and during the Department of Justice's civil rights investigation. Kevin is going to provide a law enforcement perspective on civil unrest, including lessons learned from managing the Baltimore riots. Kevin? Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I, I could listen to Jose all day long. Um, I, I'll tell you one statistic that Jose mentioned that, that concerns me and, and really should concern all of us as, as Americans is the fact that 21% of folks seem to think that it's okay to uh, engage in, in criminal behaviors if their candidate doesn't prevail. And I, I think that's a, it's a red flag for, for America. So as I speak to folks about the coming days, particularly the November 3rd through the January 20th timeframe, although it's a little broader than that, uh, I, I encourage people, whether you're in an urban setting, suburban setting, or rural setting, to take your rose-colored lenses off now. Uh, put aside the notion that it can't happen to you, because it can happen to you. Um, you know, just in the last 48 hours alone, and Jose mentioned the police-involved shooting in Philadelphia, uh, we are now seeing demonstrations related to that um, police-involved shooting uh, at multiple places across the country. Um, last night in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital, uh, Actually, it actually occurred a couple of days ago, but the person involved just died yesterday, I believe. It was a police pursuit of a motorcyclist. The motorcyclist crashed, was injured, and he died a couple of days later. And one of the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C.'s police stations was surrounded. Projectiles were being thrown at police officers. Fireworks were being set off. So it can happen anywhere. And it wasn't too long ago in our country uh, particularly in law enforcement, public safety, private security, if a controversial incident occurred at a particular geographical location, the protests were specific to, to where it occurred. It didn't necessarily spread. And the first time I saw it spread uh, in my career was really around the time of uh, the Michael Brown death in Ferguson, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, um, Eric Garner in New York. Uh, we were seeing for the first time protests take place across the country, regardless of where the controversial incident occurred. And we were at that time and place in the city of Baltimore in 2015. Um, we certainly uh, managed successfully several peaceful protests that calendar year surrounding those other events. Um, we were guilty of uh, this notion that, that a riot couldn't happen in the city of Baltimore. Um, you know, we're the eighth largest police department in the country, we hadn't had civil unrest or a riot since 1968. So following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So Baltimore had gone from 1968 to 2015, certainly with its fair share of protests, but nothing violent, no, no riot had erupted. So as a police department, and we weren't the only police department guilty of this, 
uh, we kind of put civil disturbance preparedness off to the side. And while we would teach it in the police academy, while we would have a mandatory half a day field event, uh, and while we would issue some baseline equipment, helmets, wooden batons, uh, and if you're lucky, you got an old cracked shield, uh, we didn't focus on it as an organization. And like other police departments and, and organizations, we were always competing with, with other priorities. Uh, the budget's always a priority, and we kind of lived here and now in the crime fight. So. When Freddie Gray, a young man in his mid-20s, was taken into police custody um, on April the 12th, 2015, he actually lived in a coma for several more days before he died. As a matter of fact, he lived for one week before he died. Uh, during that one week, we saw protests in the city of Baltimore. They were peaceful. Uh, there were no arrests. There were peaceful protests. They were orderly. Um, you know, we, we managed them. Uh, without much effort at all. And we fell into a false sense of security. And during that time frame, when we should have been, if we were, had our eyes wide open and our blinders off, we should have been looking at other places in the country that were experiencing riots, and we should have done more to anticipate. And really, that's what my next 15 minutes or so will be about, anticipation. I used to say, if you can anticipate, you can prevent. I'm not so sure that that's always accurate, but if you can anticipate, you can certainly mitigate. So I think as we're all going into this election season, we are in anticipation mode and an hour or so on a webinar like this is time well spent, in my opinion. Um, we're gonna say a lot of things that are already on your minds, uh, but perhaps one or two suggestions will kind of surface and, and you can take that and put it into, into action. So we didn't have memorandums of agreements or memorandums of understanding with surrounding police departments. We had no contact, if at all, uh, with the uh, Maryland National Guard about their readiness, their preparedness, their, their response time, their capabilities, if in fact we called on them uh, in the event we needed help. Uh, we weren't coordinated with the stakeholders in the big city, um, colleges, universities, the business community, uh, faith communities. Uh, we, we were kind of holding our breath and we knew that there was a likelihood that Freddie Gray was going to die. So when he died on April the 19th, we saw several more days of peaceful protests. So that lulled us into a, you know, a further sense of complacency. And it, it wasn't until a uh, peaceful protest that occurred Saturday, uh, April the 25th. And I'm mentioning that these dates because the time frame really matters here. Um, on April 25th, there was a peaceful protest, a couple of thousand people at City Hall, it ended at about 6.15 p.m., and as that peaceful protest ended, a, um, a nationally known organizer, and, and I'm not going to say his name and get myself in trouble, but he pulled a group, a, a large group of a bunch of young men to the side, and all of a sudden, and I remember seeing this with my naked eye, they started running uh, across the city from east to west, right downtown, and we were thinking, where in the heck are they going? Well, if we had our eyes wide open, we would have anticipated that they were Sure enough, making their way to a 7.05 p.m. Baltimore Orioles baseball game. So that was our first indication of uh, real unrest and, and, and damage and criminal activity, criminal behaviors. And that was the, the flashpoint of the Baltimore riots in 2015. It went on into the night at the Western District, the district station where Freddie Gray was transported to. Um, Freddie Gray broke his neck. At some point in time during the, tra the prisoner transport, prisoner transport was uh, longer than it should have been. But by the time he got to the station, he had suffered from a broken neck and he was suffocating. So he, uh, by, by the time he was afforded medical attention, uh, he, it was probably already a foregone conclusion that he wasn't going to live. So um, other anticipatory, anticipatory steps that we didn't take at the time had to do with the uh, local school system. Um, Freddie Gray's funeral was two days after that April 25th protest that ended in a riotous behavior at the Orioles game and ended in a, a riotous behavior at the Western District Station. So on Monday, April 27th, the day of his funeral, uh, we didn't coordinate with the school board. And in Baltimore, like other big cities, the students aren't transported by yellow school buses. They take mass transit, uh, city mass transit. And we literally had in a very small area of less than one square mile, about 5,000 students 
uh, high school, middle school students let out in a big transportation hub when just down the street, a police car went up in flames and a group of folks had made their way to the shopping mall, Baltimore's only indoor shopping mall, and were looting the shopping center as 5,000 students are getting dropped off, if you can imagine that. Uh, other pockets of chaos were kicking off that day. Uh, we should have done a better job anticipating and communicating and preparing. We were holding our breath. We were guilty of the sin of it can't happen to us. Uh, Baltimore, by the way, um, is absolutely fantastic at crowd, large crowd management. Uh, whether it's the Baltimore Orioles or the Baltimore Ravens or the Baltimore Marathon uh, or the 4th of July celebration or, or our own Super Bowl in Baltimore every year is the Preakness Stakes, uh, one of the Triple Crown races. And, and that, that event garners more people than any Super Bowl. So we're really, really good at crowd management, the flow of people. Um, but that's not a riot. It's not a riot. And, and I always and I probably should have done it earlier, uh, make it a point to say there's nothing wrong with a peaceful protest. There's nothing wrong or unlawful or un-American about exercising your First Amendment right. Um, certainly that defines our country and who we're all about. But a peaceful protest is a different thing than criminal behaviors that are associated with riots. It's not okay to loot, to burn, and to hurt others. And during that two-week time period or so, we went into a curfew late. Uh, there was some miscommunication, a little bit of strife between the mayor's office and the governor's office at the time uh, regarding when we were going to call in the National Guard. We probably did that a little too late. Um, and then we were, we were delayed on when we were going to enact a curfew. The curfew was good. It certainly settled things down a bit. It was a 10 p.m. curfew. But the mistake we made was when we went into the curfew, we stayed into it too long. And nobody wanted to call us out of a curfew. So it was almost easier calling us into a curfew than, than calling us out of it. So these things uh, are uh, should be anticipated. They should be spoken about now when the skies are blue and the weather's nice and everybody's not under uh, stress. Uh, because if you practice and if you talk these things out and you chalk talk the X's and O's, you're more likely to perform uh, that way under, under pressure. Uh, luckily for us, no police officers, no residents, no citizens were killed during the Baltimore riots, but we did have about, we did have 168 police officers who were treated for non-fatal injuries at our local trauma hospital. Uh, two of the police officers suffered uh, everlasting brain trauma uh, injuries. So people people were hurt. We had 42 pharmacies in the city that were looted, and the DEA conservatively estimates that over 400,000 doses of prescription pills, mostly oxycodone and other opioids hit the streets of Baltimore like that. And if you remember the violent surge associated with the riots, uh, we had 45 uh, murders uh, the first month the riots hit, 45. And Baltimore is typically a violent city anyway, but the violence spiked and it's literally stayed there for about, about six years now. Um, probably Okay, you can't see it in this slide, but the bottom of the slide is a picture of one of the officers that the state's attorney charged. There were six police officers involved in the transportation of Freddie Gray from the scene of his arrest to the district station. The state's attorney charged all six of them with various crimes up to and including murder. So as soon as we were coming out of the riots in 2015, and I was appointed police commissioner, that's a that's a heck of a welcoming. Uh, the, the mayor of Baltimore told me, the, I mean, her marching order to me was singular in nature. And she told me, and I remember like it was yesterday, she said, we cannot have another riot in this city. And the reason why she was so concerned, and I was and others, is because we knew that these six trials of police officers were coming up. And a lot of talking heads, uh, a lot of subject matter experts, a lot of politicians were predicting that if the verdicts were anything other than guilty, then this city was going to literally burn to the ground. So we had a lot of work to do. Um, one of the things we did was we, we, we reestablished a chaplain's program, folks, that we could put on the ground. We had none. And within six months, we had 132. And we used them to mitigate, to diffuse, to deescalate. They were a godsend, forgive the pun. Uh, we also established a joint information center, a page we stole out of the FBI's playbook. Um, it was a place for stakeholders um, and 
uh, large institutions to send a representative during anticipated unrest scenarios where we could feed them hourly updates and information so they could then relay it to their constituents before they saw it on the news. Um, we were in our silo back in 2015 of just a police operational center. And from that, we didn't communicate in a timely way with the business community, private security, the colleges and universities, and, and other stakeholders. So we kind of, we got that right in 2016. And we stood up this jick on half a dozen occasions uh, because in fact, anyone who paid attention or remembers so much has happened since 2015 of those six police officers who were criminally charged, three of the cases resulted in acquittals or not guilty verdicts, and the other three cases were dismissed. And we didn't have one riot, not one riot. And in public safety, particularly in law enforcement, it's hard to get credit when something doesn't happen. I wish that were a category, but it, and it being riots 2.0, didn't happen because of a lot of hard work that we did in a collaborative manner that we weren't prepared to do just a year before in 2015. We made a grand total of two arrests throughout those trial verdict scenarios and, and a person arrested. Actually, the two arrests were the same person. Um, I, you probably recognize his name, too, but I won't mention that. Uh, but we, we got it right. Um, it, but sometimes you have to experience challenges to, to have the opportunity to, to get something right. As we go into this time period, um, you know, lessons learned. Um, I'll just say this, and these are probably going to come up with some questions. The number one question I'm getting right now is, when do we put up the plywood? When do we board up our workplace? That's a judgment call that you have to make. Um, right now, most people are working from home, so that makes the decision a little bit easier. I would say this, uh, going into that physical shutdown plywood mode, uh, certainly some would argue sends a message that uh, it's now okay for people to come and behave in a criminal manner, to destroy, to loot, to vandalize. For folks who make that decision to, to board up, uh, just make sure it's an informed decision and make sure you have a decision to, to reopen and to recover. Because if you stay in that lockdown mode too long, it just becomes a self-perpetuating um, case. And, and that's something folks should avoid. Look at Israel as a country. Israel cleans up things faster, quicker, and better than any other country uh, in, in, in the world. And as you look to identifying projectiles and trash dumpsters and uh, having first aid and fire suppression equipment at your workplaces. You have to have alternative transportation modes for your employees to, to get home if, in fact, they're stuck at your workplace. Shelter in place, do you have overnight bedding? Is that available? Have you identified a spokesperson for your organization in case you land on the, on the, on the national news? And it shouldn't be the person at the top of the food chain. Uh, have you communicated to your employees your social media policies? I think sometimes people, when they're uh, confronted with uh, conflict and they're, and they're they're in the midst of something they've never been involved in, they take to a social media keyboard and they say things that could uh, cause reputational harm to the organization they work for or represent. So now's a good time to do all those things, to get people ready, to take off the rose-colored lenses, to anticipate it, to be prepared for it, and to literally draw up your X's and O's now. Relationships with local law enforcement are key. Uh, if you have cameras, make sure you know someone within your local police department that you can send your camera footage to um, and, and take advantage of the relationships you've already built. If you happen to not have solid and strong relationships right now, um, start building. And you might not be able to build them right this moment. There's a lot of things are going on, but make it a priority going forward to spend time, resources and attention on building relationships that can help you get through a crisis. Tony, I'm going to move over to you now. Tony's a senior security consultant with World Aware's Global Assistance and Response Team. He previously worked as a senior intelligence analyst focused on political violence and armed conflict and is also a veteran of the U.S. Army Special Forces. Tony is going to provide tips on how you can build an effective crisis management plan. Tony? All right. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Jose. And thanks to the commissioner, too. We've identified a few scenarios that, that could play out in the coming days and weeks. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to prepare for it? You know, a, a good place to start is by gaining an understanding of our respective organizations' risk profiles. Every organization, every individual, every activity has a unique risk profile because every location and every snapshot in time presents a unique blend of threats and vulnerabilities that we're going to have to contend with. 
Uh, more simply, risk is never static, so our efforts to manage it must also be continuous. When we're selecting controls and countermeasures to mitigate vulnerability, we may find some practices that work for us now in the moment, but there are no permanent fixes, right? So there's never any one size fits all solution. Uh, we're dealing with a pandemic right now, inclement weather and, and a pretty contentious election campaign. So as security professionals, we have to be agile and quick to adapt as situations develop. But we don't want our risk management strategy to look like a game of whack-a-mole either. Uh, so in order to respond effectively, efficiently and gracefully as stressors emerge and evolve, we have to understand, monitor and respond to our risk profile constantly. How do we do that? We do it by simply addressing three questions. What do we need to protect? What do we need to protect it from? And what do we have to protect it with? What do we need to protect? This should go without saying, but people are always priority one. From a security perspective, when you're writing a plan, regardless of the scope, the phrase ensure life safety or some kind of variation should always top the to-do list in the mission statement or the purpose. Uh, but we also have a responsibility to protect our organization's property, both real property and IP. Uh, and we have a role in safeguarding our organization's essential functions and operations as well. What are we trying to protect our assets from? I know the driver behind this particular discussion is the potential for unrest leading up to and post elections in the US, uh, but we need to be careful not to get tunnel vision there. Uh, you know, peaceful protests can lead directly or indirectly to some altogether very different stressor that can impact your organization's operations. You know, we want to take an all hazards approach to risk management here because there are no shortages of stressors that can disrupt normal operations. So it's important that we design plans to mitigate the one factor that we control, our vulnerabilities, right? And we don't want to spend too much time worrying about specific threats and hazards, right? We want to know what they are, right? We want to know what those threats and hazards are, what each one is capable of and how frequently, but more often than not, we have zero control over outside stressors. So let's focus on what we can control. This is where World Aware's risk management, continuous risk management model comes into play. Next slide, please, Mary. What do you have in place to protect your people and assets? In the lead up to the US, the US elections, the low hanging fruit's easy, right? Access control, perimeter barriers, surveillance and monitoring capabilities, uh, MAAs, MOUs, uh, you know, moving vehicles or restricting access to parking areas, clearing perimeter debris, hiring additional security personnel. But beyond these obvious physical security measures, what plans and processes do you have in place to safeguard your people and your essential assets and functions, right? You know, as the commissioner said, most organizations are already doing this, but if you're not, can you issue a remote work policy, right? If, if remote work is not an option for your organization, can you come up with a modified work plan, particularly on election day? Uh, if you have to have staff on site, make sure you brief all your personnel on your site specific emergency response plans. You want to ensure those emergency evacuation protocols, those shelter in place protocols, and any other site specific incident management plans you may have in place are fresh in people's minds as, as election day approaches. Um, for staff working on site, particularly in major population centers, do you have a backup transportation plan for those who may be, for whatever reason, cut off from their ride? If you have people who depend on public transportation, do you have a plan in place in the event that gets shut down in your city? Right? How are you going to track your people? Do you know where they are? Right? Are you sure? Uh, do you have a documented communications plan so you can reach them if you need to? Have you built out some redundancy there? You know, what if your cell phone's down, lost, stolen, battery drained, whatever? What are your alternate contingency and emergency means of communication? Do you have a monitoring and intel function in your in your in your program? You know, who monitors for changes in your risk profile? You know, who's looking out for increased exposure, increased vulnerability, or increased disruptor intensity? We'll call it right in in, in our areas of operation. Have you prioritized your intelligence requirements? Have you communicated those intelligence requirements to your Intel team? In other words, are you asking the right questions to the right people so they're not haphazardly collecting and, and analyzing anything and everything that pings their radar? Analysis paralysis is a real thing here. So if you have an Intel function, make sure you're using them wisely. You know, staying in that same vein, do you have a way to disseminate that intelligence, some kind of warning or notification capability, a mass comms tool? Are you actively refining response and recovery plans? Um, have you identified triggers or thresholds to, to, to activate those plans? 
Um, you know, what are what are your red, you know, what what are your 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 red lines? Uh, most organizations have emergency action plans or emergency response plans, incident management plans, whatever you want to call them, in place at, at their facilities covering all sorts of stressors, weather related, civil unrest, kinetic attacks, you know, fire, smoke, flood, chemical releases, et cetera. But have you done the same thing for your home-based employees, right? Since COVID, a lot of organizations have transitioned to a remote workforce. Take this time now to offer some guidance to your home-based employees. Show them how to put together their own incident management plan for, for, for them and their families. You know, start with the basics, like the commissioner said, evacuation protocols, emergency communication, shelter in place protocols. You know, once you have that foundation laid, once you've got plans in place to ensure basic needs, right, to ensure life safety, right, then you can start building out a, a, a continuity of operations program, right? When, 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 and when you're putting those together, you know, that's the, we're gonna need to make sure we identify and prioritize essential functions and, and put together plans and workarounds to minimize single points of dependency and single points of failure. But, you know, the bottom line, I don't want to belabor this, this too much. The bottom line, the more prepared we are, the less vulnerable we are, and the more resilient we will be when, when something inevitably breaks bad. You know, again, it doesn't matter what the stressor is. We don't have any control over that. We just want to be prepared for, you know, taking all hazards approach to preparedness. Uh, you know, that kind of individual resilience will greatly enhance collective organizational resilience. Um, drilling down a bit further, uh, as, as Mary mentioned earlier, building out a crisis management program. Um, have you taken have you taken the time to review your crisis management program? You know, at, at World Aware, we differentiate between crisis and emergency. Uh, we consider an emergency any event for which we already de designed a plan, I any event for which we have a plan in place to respond and recover from, from, from its impact. A crisis, on the other hand, is any event for which we haven't planned for, or any event that exceeds our pre-planned mitigation. Um, so for organizations whose resilience program may still be in its infancy, the likelihood of any disruption, you know, regardless of its level of intensity, escalating to the level of what World Aware considers uh, considers to be a crisis is going to be high. So we want to make sure we develop plans to contend with those unknowns. Um, when we build out a crisis management team, you know, we stress the importance of a collaborative effort. Uh, at a minimum, next slide, please, Mary. At a minimum, we, we try to bring in reps from communications and marketing, uh, reps from the security, IT, legal, finance shops. Um, but, but, you know, really, we want to bring in key stakeholders from, from as many functional areas of the organization as possible. We certainly don't advocate leadership by committee during a crisis, but we still want that input during the planning process. Um, when we're talking about designing a crisis management plan, we want to see a clear hierarchy, uh, lines of authority and succession plans, clear roles and responsibilities, a documented decision making process, and probably most importantly, a robust communications plan. Um, a comms plan for internal and external stakeholders. Who on the CMT is tasked with communicating what to whom? I think I said that right. Uh, via what platform and 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 how often? Um, you know, bad news doesn't get better with time. So a big function of the CMT is to control the flow of information. Uh, communicate what you know and be honest about what you don't. You know, you don't want to lose control of the narrative, but you also don't want to speculate or convey anything. Uh, you know. It could convey the wrong thing. Um, if you don't know, communicate you don't know, and then go find out. Um, you know you can't you can't communicate enough during a crisis. So when we talk about roles and responsibilities of the crisis management team, again, remember life safety is always priority one, but then priority two is working to stabilize the incident. Um, having that decision making process and methodologies uh, documented in the crisis management plan is invaluable. We like the planning piece seen here. This is actually uh, scraped directly from World Aware's crisis management plan. Um, but there's no such thing as the way, right, when, when it comes to crisis management. Um, there are several methodologies that can be drawn from to tailor a process that works for you and your team. Uh, just put something in place, make sure it's documented, uh, make sure you rehearse it and, and expose any gaps in the process and continually refine it. Uh, you know, re remember, risk is a continuum, right? So it, it's never static. We need to you know, we need to be continually refining our, our, our plans and processes to combat it. Um, you know, however, I want to stress here that it, it's important to remember that the crisis management team is not a silver bullet. 
the CMT can only do so much. Really what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about de designing a CMT is, is, is putting a mechanism in place to prevent something bad from getting worse. That's what crisis management boils down to. You're still going to need some kind of recovery strategy to help restore the organization to normalcy once that crisis subsides. 